Ask Alex. Ask Alex. Because you don't know what you don't know. And if you don't know, now you know. Yeah. So, Carlos, why don't you tell me about uh, who you are and what you're working on? I'm a... Uh... I have a company called uh, Pure Money Technology. Sure. And the uh, objective or the vision is to introduce what is called a stable coin. And a stable coin is like, it's a cryptocurrency, but it's as stable as the dollar. So the idea is people should be able to use their cryptocurrencies in their daily lives, like going to restaurants, uh, you know, buying groceries. Right now, that's not the case. And the main reason is that cryptocurrencies are volatile. No vendor would want to accept them in their business because their business is already uh, risky, right? Sure. And then you added on top of that, the risk of accepting a currency that's volatile, then you don't want that. At the same time, on the customer side, they don't want to spend their cryptocurrency because uh, it could increase in value tomorrow and they would regret having spent it today. So that's the main reason why cryptocurrencies are not being used for you know, daily purchases. Okay. <clears throat> so the way we're going, there are now many stable coin companies, right? Several of them, and in fact, they're well-funded. Um, our main difference is in the way we are going to introduce this thing to the market. It's a multifaceted market. And uh, most attempts to introduce cryptocurrencies so far have worked on the spend side, what I call the spend side. We're going to focus instead on the accept side, which means basically we are going to introduce a point of sale app that allows small vendors, small mom and pop shops, you know, like Square, that, that was the strategy of Square. Um, allow them to accept cryptocurrencies and yet receive it not in cryptocurrencies, let's say Bitcoin, but in a stable coin. And that's going to be our stable coin. So imagine if you are a Vietnamese restaurant. Um, you put a sign up to your door that says, uh, say, Ether, Ethereum or Ether is accepted here. Uh, somebody comes in with Ethers. He wants to pay with his Ethers using his wallet. Um, the uh, wallet scans our QR code that's running. We will have a POS app running on the Vietnamese restaurants. Uh, um, you know, the, the, the person in charge of uh, the, cash, the cashier. And uh, scans the code and uh, hits pay and it gets paid. Um, that's well and good, right? Because uh, we are allowing the uh, ether owner to spend their ethers and we are allowing the, uh, the restaurant owner to receive the payment in a cryptocurrency that is stable in price, mm -hmm. which remove the risk for him. Okay. And it's very easy for us to do this. When we receive the ethers, we sell it right away. And so we have the U.S. dollars corresponding to that ethers. And when the uh, restaurant owner claims the uh, U.S. dollars from us, we will already have the U.S. dollars in hand. And we will still allow for five days for us to, to, to deposit the, uh, the amount into his bank. Now, that's well and good. The most interesting thing happens when this restaurant Manager now goes to uh, buy his next week's supply. He finds out that Safeway or one of his suppliers, the groceries, also use our POS app. Would it be more convenient for him to just use our stable coin to pay for his groceries instead of having to convert it to US dollars first? At that instant, when he uses our stable coin to buy his stuff mm. his next week's supply at that point we become a currency because the amount that he does not claim from us now goes into circulation it will not be uh claimed from us so now we have this us dollar which is deposited there with us meant for claiming 
the, the, the stable coin that he's holding, but instead he uses it to, to buy stuff at the uh, grocery. So that's, that's basically the, the idea. Introducing a cryptocurrency, a stable one, that uh, makes the, uh, makes the uh, a vendor happy, allows the current cryptocurrency owners to spend their cryptocurrencies. And later, this is important, because when, when that, when that uh, restaurant owner goes to the grocery, the grocery, our POS app also accepts our own stable coin, of course, not just cryptocurrencies. And it allows the, um, the, uh, the restaurant owner to, to spend it. So what are you stuck with? Well, as you can see, I, it took me a long time to explain that, right? And it takes a lot of uh, thinking on the listener's side. And I think that's my problem is I don't know how to sell this to, uh, to investors, this idea. I think it's going to be a big thing. And this is really a big thing. And, and, and I, 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 it's, it's going to work. Um, and... Um, so when, when, when vendors start accepting PUR from, from anybody, then our stablecoin becomes a real currency. And that's a big thing. Having a real uh, a currency that you manage yourself is, is, uh, is huge. So your issue is that you want to raise money and you don't know how to communicate your idea to investors. Yes. I think that's my issue. <laughs> Maybe more than that. Uh, most of the uh, people I've talked to so far says, you know, uh, it's a good idea, but you have to have some traction yeah. and that's uh, what I'm working on also. <clears throat> okay. So the, the, so I am very dubious about this whole crypto thing. I think 99% of it's just full of absolute bullshit and all it is, is <laughs> and bandits looking to abuse neophyte idiot investors who are flogging things because they think they're going to get a thousand X return on something. Okay. But there's actually very few fundamentals. And the vast majority of people who have reached out to me have no business model. They just say, blockchain, give me a valuation of $100 million. But there's no actual real logic behind it. So if you were to pitch investors, I'd say something like, currently there are millions of people who are transacting online and buying things and you know, exchange of value uh, online. Okay? There is billions of dollars being transacted in this ether world online. Um, but there's no way to actually buy things in the real yeah. world um, right. at the moment, right? So what and if I gave you the reason why? Yeah. Okay, but what if it was as easy as PayPal or you know or Square to be able to use cryptocurrencies to purchase offline? Wouldn't that solve a problem? Because I don't know, mom and pop shops would more likely get more business or something. The problem is everything I just said is a freaking lie. Okay, there are not millions and millions of people transacting with Ether online. And I don't think that mom and pop shops will make more business because you can suddenly pay with Ether. Right? And it's so uh, volatile, you know, people fundamentally wouldn't, which is something you're solving for. But fundamentally, there aren't millions of people doing this. And mom and pop shops wouldn't make more money if they were able to ac uh, accept this as a new form of currency. You're not saying like they would adopt it because, you know, the two and a half percent that they're paying to MasterCard would suddenly decrease and therefore they'd be saving thousands or tens of thousand dollars a year. You're not actually solving a real thing. You're going, oh, this is a cool technology. This should kind of exist for other things. But you're not actually, you're not thinking about mom and pop shop and going, they have a problem, right? And for consumers, like why do they need Ether to pay for something as opposed to anything else? It's the mom and pop shop that's taking the two and a half percent or an online store that's taking a three and a half percent on PayPal or something. Like it's not solving anything. The only reason I would buy Ether or I did buy Ether was because I thought the price was going to go up. I couldn't give two shits if uh, about actually using Ether. And I don't think most people can either because it's all skepticism. You're saying, oh, people don't want to use the cryptocurrency because they're worried it might go up tomorrow. Well, why don't they just use the cryptocurrency and buy more today you know like if they thought yeah, yeah, I, I, putting more money in but it's the, i can have money in my pocket or i can have money in a crypto or a stock or something but it's it's fungible it doesn't matter money is money if i need to buy a pack of fags for 10 pounds mm -hmm. then 10 pounds is coming from somewhere but why does it fundamentally need to come off a cryptocurrency other than you think it's cool technology well how about this uh when you use a credit card, 
mm. you spend uh, in addition to what you spend two to three percent in transaction fees how about if we remove that transaction fee is that a big benefit not to me it's a big benefit to shop yeah right uh to you but, though but fundamentally how are you going to make money if you're not having transaction fees and that's the whole that's the whole idea um when you have a currency your own currency you become a central bank mm -hmm. and the central bank basically manages that currency on their own they earn their profits by um the, the the capital that they have to own to back the currency right like uh, the central bank owns uh, all kinds of bonds right now all kinds of stocks um, in fact even uh, real estate uh, bonds um, so this uh, cryptocurrency um, medium of exchange if you're the one managing that you have to own a lot of assets in order to back your currency. So you would own, say, ethers, uh, lots of bitcoins. Uh, of course, you've heard about uh, Tether, right? Tether is a USDT. Okay, but hang on. You're finally talking about the gold standard, which disappeared in the 1960s or something in England, right? So banks may have to have risk-weighted assets holding, right? Depending on how you think about the tier one and tier three capital. But that's not necessarily the same thing for a central bank at all they will issue bonds, et cetera, to fund their economy, but not because they have a requirement to hold assets. Well, you want to hold assets in times when your currency is dropping in value or purchasing power. Let's say the US dollar uh, is dropping its uh, purchasing uh, power. Uh, excuse me, Kristen, I'm, I'm on a phone here. Could you um, just keep that down? Um, and so what you would want to do in that case in other words you have too many uh, too much of your currency circulating what you would want to do is then reduce the um the quantity of the dollars circulating out there you would want to absorb it and the way you would absorb it is you would then sell your assets say you have lots of gold right most central banks own gold they would sell their gold in order to absorb their currencies that's how they would they would reduce the quantity and by reducing the quantity of something you increase its value you increase its purchasing power in terms of currencies uh, supply and demand still works even for currencies yeah i mean basically all they do is issue more to be honest and the only way that they change potentially the the relative value of the currency is by changing the interest rates it's not about issuing more gold or something that doesn't really happen right but like this is this is us getting academic like right? what you know at the end of the day you actually need to solve a real problem and so you know your business is you think that cryptocurrency should be in the real world and i think there's a lot of people been doing this right doesn't get adopted and i'm saying the advantage is we we don't have to charge the the, the fees that normal credit cards use because we're going to earn our money one way. Maybe in the beginning we will charge, uh, you know, um, transaction fees, and that's fine. But towards the end, we will reduce that to zero, and it's possible to reduce it to zero. Why would you do that? How are you going to make so much money from an alternative means? Well, you have these assets. You, just the interest alone you earn on those assets is already large. I mean, we're talking, if, if you can grow this into something as competitive as the US dollar, that's huge, right? I mean, that's, yeah, but that's it's also huge. ignorant because it's never going to happen. And you get shut down if you ever became that large anyway. But it also presupposes that people are going to be creating the store of value into your central bank, which you know, frankly, people, the whole point of having thing in crypto world is ideally tax evasion. So no one knows how much money they have. So they're keeping it in their little hard drive or something. They're not keeping it on your bank or your, your platform. So you'll be doing peer-to-peer -peer transactions, right? Yes, this is peer-to-peer -peer transactions. The, uh, the so vendor is going to hold their assets. And there's going to be no float because it's going to be an instantaneous transaction. Well, you still have the float because you remember, the, the, the way we're going to uh, allow the vendor to exchange their, our stable 
Bitcoin for US dollars is we will actually be holding the dollar in the bank. When we sell the cryptocurrencies, you know, like ethers, the customer pays in ethers, we sell that right away in Coinbase, we get the US dollars. So right then we already have the backing for that stable coin that we just released to the vendor. So when they come back to us and say, where is our US dollars? It's already there. We pay it, we, we will deposit it into their bank account. It will take about five days. <laughs> yeah, this, all this doesn't actually funny matter because the reality is what you're saying is once we get as big as Facebook, there's lots of ways for us to make money, which is not going to happen. So right now, like you could, you, I think you emailed me originally and said, how can I validate my idea and show more traction, et cetera. So one way of doing that is you set up a landing page and you spend a couple hundred bucks on Facebook ads and you send traffic to your website, which is ideally targeted, and you have a big CTA or call to action on the top of the page which says, click here to sign up. And then you prove on, you know, on the demand side, whatever, that people will sign up for your service. And then the other one you do is you can either go knocking on doors and sell people a product that doesn't exist and see if they will pay you for your product. Or alternatively, try and acquire a supply side, or however you want to think about it, and see if merchants will sign up to your product. Mm -hmm. Without having to do one line of code, you can validate whether or not people will even purchase your product or not and figure out if it's stupid. Because theoretically, right, what you're saying may make sense. I just think you're far too early. And the reality is, timing matters. I think this whole crypto space is so, you know, uh, hot, so to speak, but no, with no real fundamentals that, you know, maybe you might have the perfect idea, but you're probably a few years too early. I just don't like, think about the adoption of Square, right? It's mm -hmm. okay, but it's not everywhere, is it? There's still a lot of yeah. people who don't use it. And now you think that, you know, you're going to leap ahead of Square. So what my, my market sizing math for you would be that you would be a tiny percentage of what Square is reasonably right now, right? Yeah. So that's basically your upside. Not only that, the customers, wow. not all of them are going to spend their Ethers and their Bitcoins, right? Right now, 5% of the population has Bitcoin, 2% has Ethers. Out of those, only 30% of them, from my survey so far, yeah. are willing to spend their, their cryptocurrencies. Well, then you're even making it smaller. So you have a percentage of people yeah. who are willing even to do it. So look, the basics of startup is that you solve a problem that people are willing to pay for. You acquire, start, you acquire a customer for one, and you hopefully sell them for three. You know, And so you make mm -hmm. twice your money back, three times your contribution margin or something. But that's all it comes down to. But you have to be solving a real problem or you're just jerking off to technology. So like I had one company ask me to be, you know, an ICO advisor for them. And I was like, okay, so how do you plan on making money? And they said, oh, we're going to issue more tokens. I'm like, it's not a fucking business model, right? You know, it, it's like it's the token. <laughs> but, you know, okay, but, you know, their business model is they're just going to get rich quick by flogging their tokens and who cares if the technology works. But that's the current thing. But if you're trying to raise real money from actual investors, then you're going to actually have to have a real business model. If you don't have a real business yeah. model, then go to ICO land and spin all the lies that everyone's telling and be like, blow my coin, it's going to be huge. Put your vesting schedule of six months, make sure that your token price doesn't decrease by doing really effective community management and sending updates, which you haven't actually done to make it look like you've made lots of progress. And then as soon as your six months have gone, exit the 20% of tokens and aggregate you took and bugger off to a tropical island. Yeah, well, in my mind, there are two ways to get money, right? You either do an ICO or <laughs> you go after the, uh, um, uh, the uh, angel investors and the, uh, the venture capitalists. Yeah. If you go the ICO way, I don't think you can, you can also go the, uh, the other way, right? Uh, I think it's either or for me. Well, there's a lot of people who are, are, are backing ICOs, but again, you need to be a real business. So your bar is actually getting real VC to fund you, which means that you need to have a go-to-market strategy and all these things. Like I, I did some advisory for some guys who then decided to do some ICO, and I was like, guys, look, look really, what is your go-to-market strategy and who are your customers? And the guy said, the CTO said to me, Alex, I think on behalf of everyone I can say, we've only been focused on the technology and we just didn't think about it. 
I'm like, how the fuck can you not think about <laughs> how you're going to get customers? But that's the state of this world. Like, if you want to build a real business, you need to solve a real problem. Mm-hmm. May be right, and I may be wrong, and it's because you're right and I'm wrong that you'll become really rich, right? Otherwise, there's no opportunity. But mm-hmm. I would think very critically about whether or not the timing is right for this. Because if you're yeah. even saying that most people don't even want to spend their ether because they think it's speculative value rather than a store of value, then you know even even your whatever your the the spenders are not going to do anything. Let alone mom and pop stores. They'll be like, "What the fuck is this ether thing?" Yeah, you're right. If, if uh, none of the crypto owners are going to uh, spend their 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 cryptos, yeah, this this whole thing will not work. Doesn't work. And that's why one of the first thing I did was uh, to do a kind of a survey. I uh, uh, asked uh, people, uh, and I, I think I asked about 300 of them, and uh, they responded, uh, it's about 30%, who says they're willing to uh, to do it. And the rest, the 70%, are not even going to think yeah, about that's it. That's crazy, because Ether sh- is theoretically should be a store of value, right? Yeah. And they should but, be fungible. Yeah. They're putting every dime that they had into it. And so, again, as I said, like, I've got $10 in my pocket, I've got $10 in Ether, and I've got $10 in my pocket, I think Ether is so valuable, that I put that $10 into it, but I'm also not worried about the volatility, at least it's somewhat stable, mm-hmm. so that, you know, if I want to buy something, I can. But again, it always comes down to very basic fundamentals, like, are you solving a real problem? Like, what is the actual problem you're solving? Not one that sounds cool. You know, and if if it is like a crazy idea, then there are ways, like I mentioned, which you can actually validate that your idea works. And then, you know, there is a there's always a more minimum of the minimum viable product that you can build to see if people will use it. And maybe you do not focus on mom and pop stores. Maybe you focus on come like on a big uh, big amount, so like um. Maybe your uh, uh, rental payments, maybe. Well, some That's people, a big you pick one use case where you think this works really well and see if you get lots of traction in one space. There may be many applications of it, but you start with one thing that you think is the easiest way in and show that works really well. And then you go to investors and say, look, I proved when everyone thought I was crazy that this will work for rental payments or some shit, right? And go, mm-hmm. the next three things we think we should do is one, two, three, okay? And then in five years' time, then we want to go to mom and pop stores because we've built such a big platform, we mm-hmm. have the opportunity to do that. But you don't, don't, like it's climbing Mount Everest, right? You want to get to the peak, but you have to earn your way as you get there. So your first step is get to base camp. Mm-hmm. So what does base camp look like? Not Everest, base camp. And then 18 months of funding, you get to like the first pit stop, and then you want to go to the next pit stop, and then seven years later, you end up at the top. But where you start and where you end can be very, very different. Yeah. But well, I, I like your idea. Um, go out there and... Um, Make an ad maybe in Facebook or LinkedIn, uh, get people to my website, and then in that website, I can uh, ask them whether they would be willing to, uh, well. Don't even ask, just pretend you have it. Lie. Yeah. Okay. And then say, oh, sorry, we're in private beta, you're on the wait list. But make it look like your product's real and see if they'll actually do it. Okay. So that's don't, the, don't say if we did it, said we have it. Do you want to use it? Yeah. And then you have this. Uh, well, I'm thinking if, if I am going to get the, uh, the, the emails of these people, I might as well use those uh, emails for, you know, uh, actually marketing the product, right? And so if I tell them, you know, I'm sorry, you know, you are in the waiting list. Hmm. Well, yeah, they may not lose interest, actually, right? I mean, they email them, right? Yeah. But so, like, I have one client that I do calls with every week, and he calls it the smoke test. And so he, uh, one part of a conversation was him migrating from being an enterprise company to more of an SME company. And I was like, how would we do that? And he kind of figured it out. And before he built it, he got, he scraped 30,000 emails, uh, A-B tested them into four segments, and then spammed everyone 
looked at open rates versus blah, blah, and figured out if anyone would actually sign up for his imaginary product. And he tested it, right? Mm -hmm. And he did this, like, in a, you know, so every, like, this guy executes like a motherfucker. Like, every single week, he's like, okay, Alex, I'm going to do something. And the next week, he's already done it, and he's written me a 25-page PowerPoint presentation about the analysis of what he's already done. Mm. And so it's not like we'll do it in two weeks. He's like, oh, shit, okay, I'll do it tomorrow. I'll send the emails the next day. Then I'll spend two days d doing analysis, and then I'll whatever. You know what I mean? But he just does yeah. boom, boom, boom. And that's what you need to do in startup because maybe, do you know what? Your idea sucks and it doesn't work, but you didn't waste three years building a product that you didn't know wouldn't work, right? Well, actually, that's what I've done. I, I built a, a minimum viable product. And uh, the thing is, it only runs on the uh, test network of the Ethereum right now. And I ran out of money uh, building it for the, the real network. Um, and so now here I am. Um, yeah, I should have done it this way. Uh, clearly <clears throat> so now you have something can maybe you should just put up the landing page and start testing it okay and so it'll be a little bit of work you build a basic landing page or something uh or you know as i told the guy in the last call i did today like landon.co l-a-n-d-e-n.co you can build like a basic SaaS landing page in like 30 seconds if you've got the content already done like super easy and then you know oh, you which side is this again i'm sorry i didn't quite get that Landon.co, L-A-N-D-E-N.co. My friend just mentioned it to me. Like, it, it doesn't make spectacularly amazing landing pages, but it makes something which is good enough. Okay. And you can do it in like a couple of minutes. It's that easy. Um, and so you just build very simple landing pages very quickly, which look fine. Uh, so if you want to quickly test things, that's a great way of doing it. So, do you know, maybe you build up one landing page, you spend $100, then you build another landing page, you build two, you spend another $100 and see which one works better even maybe, right? And okay. you can use that as a validation test for you now. And also whilst you're doing that, you can think, okay, I have built tech already. What is the single best niche application for this and it could be there's only 300 people in the world who would use it if you can find those 300 people and then market to them and show how happy those 300 people are as opposed to having 2 million people that don't care right and if you can make 300 people happy then maybe if you apply it to something new it'll be a bigger market but you'll have shown that what you actually have built actually works and people like it so by mm -hmm. being Smaller at the start, you have the potential to actually more engage with people and figure out if you'll be successful in the future. Sounds great. Yeah, I'll, I'll do that. All right, cool. Nice talking to you, Carlos. Thank you. Best of luck with your startup. Bye. Thank you, Alex. Yeah.